Hey, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Aya and we are back again. Um, well, I guess back for the first time talking about something new and exciting. And I am so honored to be joined here by Cher Hale. Um, we are actually going to be uh, alongside each other on a panel for the Hill Roundtables, which is hosted by founder and uh, moderator host, Aaliyah Walker. And we have so many great things that we want to share about this amazing event that I'm super excited and honored that Aaliyah asked me to be a part of, and I'm sure Cher feels the same way. Um, but before we get started, I would like to give Cher the opportunity to have the floor and just introduce herself. Sure. I, let's see where to start. We were just talking about how we are both obsessed with Italy. So I'm a total Italophile. Um, <laughs> Mama to a six month old, her name was Chiara, also an Italian name. And I also run a public relations agency called Ginkgo PR, where we believe that social change can be affected through public relations. And so our goal is to take these stories of historically excluded people and help them tell it with their own voices back in the mainstream media. And I love that. And since you did mention that your beautiful little baby girl has an Italian name, I'm all about names. And so what was the inspiration behind naming your PR agency Ginkgo? Mm. I'm kind of curious. Yeah, this is a, one of my favorite stories to tell. Um, I heard a story about how in the Second World War, after the US bombed Hiroshima, the scientists told them that nothing would grow in the area for like decades. And within eight months, buds were sprouting on the ginkgo trees in one of the main plazas where they were bombed. And I thought that that was such a beautiful representation of resilience, especially as it pertains to people who have been marginalized for generations. Um, just a, a good symbol of what it can look like to break through, um, overcome the odds and be able to thrive, notwithstanding our circumstances. I love that. That makes me, I do remember the beginning of that story because I do remember how, yes, they were told that basically the land was going to be barren and there was nothing that could be done about it. But I do love the fact that, yes, Mother Nature will always prevail and um, you know, the fortitude that we have within our human spirit, it's really, um, it's powerful and it's not going to be, you know, suppressed as much as outside forces may try to do that, but we're here and we're strong and we're making our way through. So I love that story. Cher and I are going to be a part of a panel titled Appreciate, Don't Appropriate. And it's going to be diving a little bit deeper into why stock photos and images just aren't enough. Um, I'll speak briefly about it. When I first heard the title, I thought that is like right to the heart and the core of how I feel and how I felt a lot about the social space and the visual imagery that I saw in light of a lot of people, which I still do feel their heart was in the right place. I definitely don't want to like discredit or discount somebody's like some sort of effort that they were making to have more inclusivity and have more diverse representation in their brand. Um, so it was nice that to see brands take, you know, take a stand and take it serious. Like, you know, we probably do have some some distance to travel here and we probably should make more of a concerted effort to be more inclusive um, across the board. So I do appreciate that. But to tie into the title, appreciate, don't appropriate, I think there was a little bit of um, a little bit of the lines are getting blurred in some aspects. So I really like the fact that Aaliyah had brought this as a, a talking point. And so I'm really excited about, you know, what we'll be able to discuss and unpack and uncover and ultimately provide some really good solutions for, you know, for businesses and brands and solopreneurs and hiring teams to kind of gain some really good insights of how to move forward. Um, but I don't want to talk uh, and take over the whole conversation. So I'd love to have you share, tell me how you feel. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really curious because we all come from slightly different backgrounds and slightly different industries. And so I'm really curious to hear the answers to all of the questions from each of you, because I think I bring uh, the perspective of like podcasting, especially to the space. So like I've been seeing a lot of change and then no change <laughs> in different podcasting spaces. And so I'm curious to know like what you've been seeing with your clients. Um, and as you've been like, you know, as we've watched Black Lives Matter spike and then kind of like fall downhill. And as we um, 
I just have seen inclusivity become like a trendy term to use, kind of like greenwashing, right? Yeah. Uh, what that's looked like, how that's manifested with our clients and within our industry. Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, I definitely have noticed, um, like you said, like there were spikes and then stuff kind of plateaued a little bit and then it kind of took a little bit of dip and then maybe something else happened. It's like, oh, wait a minute, we didn't, maybe we didn't do what, or maybe we didn't get to the root of the problem. Maybe we were just looking at the leaves. And so let's go back and revisit it. So I did see a couple people shift and they were kind of riding a roller coaster wave. It kind of felt like a little bit just from outside looking in, I don't know like the whole back end of their story and their business and their branding, but I did see where they were kind of trying to stay afloat when they were just trying to figure it out. So yeah, I'm kind of curious about other stories as well and then be able to share my perspective about it. Yeah, and so I think, I mean, when you work with your clients, do you ever have moments where you feel like, ooh, we could be doing more here, um, especially to drive like the social justice movement forward or to be more inclusive? but they don't seem to be receptive to the idea or they or they didn't bring it to the table themselves. And so like my constant struggle is always, how do I best bring this up and call people in with like compassion and love um, as opposed to making them feel ashamed or embarrassed um, that they didn't think of it first. Yeah. No, you're right, because I have a really good friend of mine. Um, I won't share her detailed information, but we had a very raw and just candid conversation like we always do. Um, and this wasn't really the point of the meeting because we're talking about something totally different, but it just came up and I'm glad it does because I'm always open and welcome to having these type of conversations as difficult as they may be, as uncomfortable as they may be. Um, it's important that we have them. And so she was just basically sharing with me that she was carrying a lot of shame and guilt because she felt attacked. Like she did have a few people like DM her or reach out to her personally and say, hey, like, how come you're not saying this? Or how come you're not doing that? And it wasn't like you said, like calling people in, like, like this is the era of like calling you out, but we should be calling people in with compassion and love because that just doesn't really feel good on either side of it, I don't think. And so she was just kind of like, I just don't know what to say and I don't wanna offend anybody. It's not that I don't care, but I don't know what to say. And I think that's why it's so important with, you know, the Hill Round Tables, because Aaliyah, like, Aaliyah was very passionate about that. She's like, yes, but um, that's important. And I'm glad you feel this way, but we wanna like undo that because that in and of itself could be, you know, problematic. And we want to be able to empower and equip you so you don't feel that way. Um, so I feel like individuals like her, which I did invite um, to attend and she got her ticket because this was like right up her alley. She's like, oh my gosh, like this is what I need. I just didn't know. I don't know how to navigate this and I definitely don't want to step on anyone's toes, but I just don't know. I don't feel equipped. Mm. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about like social justice movements, right? Like civil resistance uh, because they were trained, right? They didn't just like show up one day, like, you know, we're gonna march. This is a spontaneous event. Like there was like, this was strategic and they were trained in like nonviolent resistance. And everyone with a phone now feels like an activist which is like great on some level, but also like we're discussing here when, and with your friend, like we're not all equipped to do this work. And so we need communities or safe containers like the Hill Roundtables to educate ourselves so that we can return back to our work with like a new perspective and new lens and new tools so that we can help each other thrive, like to take care of each other in this way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And I feel like ties into one of the main things we wanted to cover today was about, you know, having that conversation and how we can educate clients on, you know, that aren't informed or aware about DEI. And for those of you in the audience who don't know what DEI means, it stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I feel like, I mean, a little bit, like maybe it's kind of become a little bit of a I don't want to say a buzzword, but it was gaining traction and a lot of people were um, mobilizing around it, which was great. Um, but I think a lot of people, I think Aaliyah had put a video up, I want to say day before yesterday, I caught one of her live streams where she was like, 
yeah, a lot of companies were doing really well, kind of how we spoke earlier, but then they had like a little bit of a plateau or a dip and they may have hired on like a DEI expert or a consultant, or maybe they had a, a training or something. Um, and I forgot exactly what she said, but I think she was like, yeah, but then I think from that point, they thought that that was enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess maybe there's like a little bit of balance. I'm kind of curious to, to unpack a little bit here of like, how, how do we know like you're doing enough, I guess, if you're completely new to this and you're open, you're ready, you're receptive, you definitely want to, and you're making this a priority. And it's like, but how do I know, like, what are the benchmarks? Like, how do I check and make sure that stuff is really on course to be, you know, progressive? Yeah, I mean, I think I want to bring this back to our own businesses, maybe as examples for what we're doing, because it's hard. It's like hard to be abstract with the work required to do diversity, equity and inclusion. Right. A lot of it has to do with our stories we tell ourselves or our, our beliefs or our biases. Um, and that stuff doesn't feel as tangible as saying things like I want to make sure that we have five more inclusive hires. Um, or I want to make sure that we donate X amount of money to um, organizations dedicated to social justice, for example. And so I think like in our own businesses or maybe examples that you've seen in others, like what are people doing to help be more measured with their approach or more goal oriented so that they can feel like, okay, we're walking toward a goal. Um, actually the campaign to have um, companies put 10% of their products to be like from black founders mm -hmm. is a really good example of this, right? You, they have a measurable amount that each company can strive toward. And so like companies have signed this pledge and they actively work toward um, merchandising with black founders. Hmm, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you'll love that. I'll send you the link and we can put it below too. Yeah, please do, please do. Yeah, it's actually, that makes me think about a conversation that Ali and I had during our Instagram live stream that we did um, a couple weeks back. And I was just like very transparent. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Like there's some work within myself. Like I don't I don't always know how to make sure that I'm showing up in, you know, in certain ways. Like I know, I guess maybe you may look at me and you think like, okay, she, has a lived experience or she has experiences and she probably you know may know this and i'm like no there's some stuff that i myself i need to be further educated on and i was even thinking about um i think I'd, i had asked i know i asked Aliyah about how would an individual um be like a creative or a, a business owner how can they put themselves in position to be highlighted and join things like that so being able to be um, I guess I had to say the word like picked or chosen because it kind of, kind of sounds funny, but like if you don't even know there's like help out there, like how do you connect the dots between the people that have access to resources or opportunities or programs and how do you position yourself to be found? Like if they're active, actively, you know, trying to find you and like how do you make yourself easily mm. accessible? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I mean, this is, this goes so much like back to the foundations of marketing and like public relations, right? Because first of all, you have to have um, a cohesive, like clear message and like an ideal target client you're talking to. You have to be specific. You have to have all like these dots lined up for yourself. Um, and then you have to make an effort to get visible, right? Like this is the hardest part. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I don't, I do not actively pitch myself. I pitch all of my clients, of course. And I see some shows where I'm like, I should, be on that show like I should pitch myself for that show and whether it's because of client load or life I just don't at the end of the day and I wait for invitations to come to me uh, but you know that isn't the most proactive approach it's not proactive at all <laughs> in fact it's super passive and I'd like to be to use like more of my skill set to make myself visible um, so that I can be in the right places at the right times right the, the more you are visible, the higher likelihood you have of being seen by the right person. Exactly. Yeah, no, I completely agree, which is why things like this, when I reached out to you and I was like, hey, do you want to collaborate on something? Because I just think there's some magic here that we can unpack and create. Um, and that typically the old me would be very shy. I wouldn't want to, I guess I would just kind of, like you said, be more passive, like, well, I'm here and it's enough and I'll just kind of make do. And I mean, it's, 
that's one way to go about it. I mean, I know people do teach like marketing strategies on how to like be more like people reaching out to you, but you know, I think there's, yeah, we do need to a little, I, I guess I equate it to sports where it's like being on office offense versus mm -hmm. defense. And I think sometimes we can be a little bit on the offense a little bit too much and being more passive and not actively trying to put more points up on the board. Like maybe we do need to have more of a balance. And I definitely, I'm speaking for myself here because I've definitely have found that um, in my own journey about, you know, just business and this like and life in general just being able to show up in meaningful ways and get over that timidity i guess i was i don't know experiencing <laughs> yeah i mean you mentioned earlier that you're filipina right i'm taiwanese um timidity was socialized into us this is unfortunately like the reality of the situation mm -hmm. um it was always safer to be quiet safer to be invisible and so one of the, hmm, one of the uh, works that I'm constantly doing on myself is evaluating, am I being quiet to be safe or am I being quiet because I don't want to be involved in this conversation? Mm -hmm. uh, and so constantly stopping myself and reflecting and saying like, okay, this is like the work of on socializing all of the things have been put into me and like I want to be able to have a, a clear slate and like know what's me and like what is other well, I love you said how you said that because I never looked at it that way I yeah I just you're right it was a, a programming and a socially engineering like I was very much like quiet and you have to be a certain way and that's not ladylike or that's not graceful or that's you know not okay or we don't do that or that's just not our you know wow I never looked at it that way okay. yeah like there's a whole trope of like the timid the attractive timid young Asian woman right yes more beautiful when she's quiet yes and, it, and you know it's interesting because that was that was obviously was never said directly but now that you're making me think about complete instances in my childhood and life where that was totally being said to me but it just wasn't being said to me <laughs> I didn't even realize yeah, exactly I mean it's even like the subtle when like your mother would like put her hand on you while you were talking to be like stop talking now <laughs> right <laughs> it's like in the smallest uh behaviors and so this is something I'm constantly aware of with Kiara I'm like okay you know, she's six months old, she can't even talk yet. <laughs> but like, as she begins to vocalize and verbalize her opinion, um, how can I like watch myself to make sure that she feels safe enough to, to use her voice? Because for a long time, I didn't feel safe to use my voice, which is where yeah. a lot of us are at. And so, you know, when we have to have difficult conversations with our clients about like a sticky topic, right? How are, they, are you being racist essentially? Um, yeah unintentionally or intentionally um, how do we bring that up you know because again they are paying us and there's a balance here between being in our integrity and making sure that we are continuing to pay our bills there's always this balance we're, we're walking exactly I completely agree yeah I noticed the same thing too with my daughter whose name is kind um I, her name came to me in a dream. Um, I don't really know where it came from, but yeah, she just, well, I had these thoughts about, we need more kindness in the world. And so you just, it just fit and it just fits her personality. So here she is. I love it, so cute. Um, but she is very much, she's a lot more extroverted than I am, um, which is a good thing because at first I was kind of like, like she's super like, talkative like she's outgoing she's like that social butterfly personality um and I find myself like having to kind of curtail like trying doing the little like okay that's enough now type of stuff because I don't want to squelch her passion and and her confidence like she has some crazy confidence and I'm like <laughs> I never had that it took me years and getting out of college to kind of develop this and train and studying and taking master classes and stuff and she's like born with it um, so I definitely want to make sure that I am allowing her to flow in that and, you know, take that initiative because she's so like, she'll walk up to you in a heartbeat and introduce herself and talk and be best friends with you in 10 minutes. Like, and so I love that she has that energy, that spirit about her that I definitely know that's going to carry her along 
you know, down the way in her life to be successful in whatever she pursues, which is currently art. She wants to be an artist. Oh, um, working with her on pursuing that. And you have to have confidence and no matter what you're pursuing. So if she wants to be an artist, I'm like, okay, you're going to have to have some thick skin and really get out there and make a way for yourself. So I'm definitely want to keep her on that path. Um, so I don't want to go off too much of a tangent, but I'm so passionate about that. So I'm happy you brought that up. Um, I mean, parenting is like the topic I could never stop talking about, right? Like, <laughs> yes. Cause there's just, yeah, there's just so much. It's there's endless. So much. It's endless. <laughs> I could go back and forth, like with my other mom, mompreneur friends, as I call them. And mm -hmm. we'll just, we'll talk business, but then like, yeah, we're always going back and forth about the babies. Like, oh my gosh, they did this. And what about this? And then like <laughs> even drawing like little, like morals of the story, if you will, about things that happen. It's just like, huh, it's the darndest thing. Like kids teach you the darndest thing sometimes. Best teachers. So, so yeah. Well, um, I did, let's see, I had a question here because you said something really powerful um, about, you know, educating our clients, <clears throat> excuse me, and, you know, um, having those type of conversations essentially where it's like, yes, we are paying us um, at the same time, having those moments where it's like, yes, but if it's a moral, you know, standpoint or integrity, like, you know, I really feel it is our, it's our duty to, to say something. Um, and so I wanted to ask you specifically, share just in terms of like the clients that you work with, um, do you also find yourself educating on both sides of the equation in terms of like the outlets and the media, um, channels that you pitch your clients to, like, how do you bridge the gap between making sure both are cohesive and aligned with like your overall messaging? So you, you represent under... Um, underrepresented and marginalized individuals who don't get their stories told properly. I think we've seen a ton of memes around, not to go off on a tangent, but um, I've been studying a lot of um, Egyptian history. I've been really fascinated about it. And I've seen a lot of people be very upset and a lot of public outcry recently, I think, because people are kind of, I guess, waking up or just kind of going back in history to kind of see how did we get here which is day one of the hills round table so it's perfect perfect starting point um but i've had several people say things like you know when they put up a film starring elizabeth taylor and put her as cleopatra when there's no way that a woman that looked like elizabeth taylor was you know so stuff like that so how do you um how do you bring that together because like you know, with what you do and how you help your clients and then like the platforms that you are hoping obviously to have them featured and, you know, connect with. Yeah, I think a lot of this starts with making sure that I'm attracting the right person into my world and that I'm vetting them properly, right? So like, if you come to me and you are white, cisgender, heterosexual, all of the things that are just like your basic white person, uh, I'm going to look at your website and I'm going to say, do you have any mention of diversity, equity, or inclusion on here? If I go through social media, am I going to see any mention of advocacy or allyship? And if I don't, I've learned over the years to not dance around the question where I used to be like, so, you know, were you, would you consider yourself an ally? Now I say things like, what is your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion? because I only allocate 30% of my roster to allies or advocates um, who are not marginalized. And if you don't fall into, the, into this criteria, I, I won't work with you. And so like a lot of the, the basic racist stuff that might happen with people who aren't conscious of what they're doing or saying doesn't happen in my world because I don't let it in. I filter all those people out. But on the off chance that they come to me and they say, hey, I want to do this and I'm not sure it's gonna come across the right way. What do you think? I do my best to be as honest as possible because if I'm not, the audience will be, right? We do live in a cancel culture and I wanna make sure that they hear it from me, even if it stings. Um, and so sometimes that just like creates really uncomfortable conversations. Um, and sometimes they get upset, but at the end of the day, if they get so upset that they no longer want to work with me, um, it's my job to have my client pipeline full 
that I'm able to easily replace them, right? So that I can be in my integrity and pay my bills. Like all of the business development stuff has to be locked down so that I can have this flexibility to make these calls. Yeah, I like that a lot. I like how you said, like, you just don't dance around it. You're just very to the point and firm about it. But I love the language you said, like, what's your commitment? And I think that speaks volumes because it's like, we could say, you know, cute flowery words, but it's like, no, what are you committed to doing? Because that's typically what drives behavior. Like, what have you committed to do? Um, and the conversation flows in a different a different path if you are talking about commitments as opposed to, well, I thought about this and I'd like to do this and I heard this and I read about this and that sounds nice. But yeah, I like the fact that it's just a very direct, but very compassionate and just very open and honest dialogue of like yeah what are we what are we doing here <laughs> like and yeah and it's hard I mean I tried to hire a publicist for my team about six months ago and having that was like a key question in the like this kind of video interview process and it was so uncomfortable and so apparent who has no commitment <laughs> to DEI um, which made it very easy for me to eliminate them from the process right but you have to be willing to ask the question right so what would you say to individuals who, like you said, they would come to your corner and they don't have a plan? Um, would you say like, um, well, part of it, the part of the process of when clients come to you, are you also helping them if they're not like they're within your 30% of the roster that you do allocate towards um, those type of clients? Do you help them come together and develop that? Or do they have to have at least something to bring to the table? Like, how do you... Um, gauge that? Yeah, I mean, I would love if they were working with a DEI person, right? If they had like a coach or a consultant um, on their team, would that's like a basic for me. Like if you, if you have made no progress on this journey, but you have good intentions, I would love to see you marry those good intentions with action of hiring someone who knows more than me and then more than you. <laughs> <laughs> because while I can help you with your outside image, um, I can't do the deep work of, of inside. Uh, and so someone else needs who's qualified to do that should be doing that. Right, right. I like that. Um, so leads me to ask maybe a little bit of a controversial question here, but um, have you ever ran into the hurdle or have you do you have an overcomer story, I guess, if you will, of getting, well, I don't want to say pushback, but maybe trying to carve out a way to get your client that is marginalized or underrepresented on a mainstream platform, whatever media outlet that may be, that has a history and a long line history of not really having, not to say they don't care, but because they came from like the lineage of like just having opulence and just the affluence of whatever they have that they can just do whatever they want on their platform that they own have you ever had a moment to where when you are working with a client that is underrepresented and marginalized and getting them on a platform like a big huge you know name um there's a ton of them out there so i don't have to name one in particular but one that doesn't have a history of um having dei on the forefront or priority like have you ever had to balance um and it would be a good opportunity for your client. So it's not like you're pursuing stuff that you don't think aligns, but um, on the flip side of like the media um, channels that you're connecting with, like, have you ever had, do you have like a overcomer story? Yeah, I, the question I'm hearing you ask is what happens or like, what is my strategy when I have the opportunity to have my client on a big platform? Um, but the host themselves, like they, they don't have a history of being committed to ver diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and it's, it's tricky. It really is because on one hand, obviously I want them to get all of the good press that they can possibly get. And on the other hand, I do think that it is my job to keep them safe because there is always the risk of this person tokenizing them. Um, and using, you know, their diverse background to their advantage. And so the question I have to ask is, is this person in integrity enough to not do that? Um, can I, do I feel comfortable having the conversation of 
what do you plan on talking about? Because if anything that feels like tokenization, I will call it out and I will say, hey, um, can we reword this question instead? You know, what, what is, what's your intention behind asking this question? Uh, so that my client does feel like they're in a safe space. I actually recently had a conversation with a producer. I was gonna be on a show and I noticed on the intake form that the pronoun, there were no, the question was, what is the gender rather than what are your pronouns? Hmm. And I said, hey, producer, like, what's up with this? It's like this rubs me the wrong way. You know, you know from your research of my agency that we're very inclusive. And a question about gender is just not inclusive at all. Like, what is going on? And this person shared with me that the, the host themselves, they don't believe in gender expansiveness. Um, and I had to make a, a judgment call. You know, do I want to go onto this platform and talk about the things I talk about. Will I feel safe? Will I feel like this host is receptive? Will, will this be a waste of my time? Mm -hmm. um, what should I do? And ultimately I'm keeping the interview, uh, but it's because we, I was able to have a productive conversation with the producer about this very issue. And so I think anytime that we are in a situation, it's always an, an invitation to have uh, a productive discussion and right. then we can make a call from there from where that leads that's actually going to be my next question like how would you go about advising um a client um of yours like in that type of instance but maybe they are i guess in their fiery energy and like you know what no i'm going to take this opportunity not to go in there and to be combative or that but just um I don't know. Sometimes I guess like maybe we have to forge fire and like um, have a little bit of moxie about us sometimes. Like maybe we don't, like I said, have to be disrespectful of people's platforms because obviously, you know, there's a mutual respect there. But if somebody is open, having it be like a teachable moment, like do you have ways that you kind of ensure like holistically stuff is still in alignment but at the same time you know what if this might be a challenge but we may not we're not going to back down from it even though you know the other person has like you said their belief and whatever that may be and if it's different from ours yeah i would say this depends on like where you are in your visibility visibility journey like i'm at a point in my journey where i feel comfortable being a little bit rebellious where i feel comfortable calling people in and using my voice to do that, but not everyone is at that point. And so if you feel like it's going to affect like your mental health, right? Um, or your perception of yourself, like don't do that, you know, like take the necessary precautions and like share your voice in safe spaces first and until you can build up like the courage and the resilience and the endurance to do it on bigger platforms. Like we don't have to go from zero to a hundred. We really can take incremental steps toward the level we ultimately want to be at. And so I don't want anyone to feel like they have to like be a renegade out of the gate. Like it takes years of work to be visible and feel safe doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I do like that. It's baby steps. Cause yeah, there's, there's some tar sometimes I'm being a little bit more rebellious and sometimes I'm like, mm, I don't really think that's the best or wisest use of my energy. And I just, exactly. you know, just, yeah. I like that. It's so smart because, you know, at the end of the day, that's all we have, right? Is our time and our energy. And so we have to make the smartest use of it. Um, yeah. So we've, we've got other work to do. Right, right. Which is why um, everyone who's watching, if you haven't gotten your ticket to join us on the Hills Roundtable, you should because it's literally three days. Um, we're going to be unpacking um, a ton of conversations. It's the best uses of your time. If you are looking for a place to come and just receive, be educated, learn the history, um, have the conversations in a safe space, um, and just be equipped and empowered on different ways of how you can be a, you know, a force of change, I guess, and you will, uh, if you will, in your lane and whatever industry, whatever walk of life you've come from. Um, and I think also too, for me personally, I'm looking at it from a standpoint of um, just the collective energy that is being poured into this, just like all just the love and the admiration and just like the respect and just like a, a lot of us coming together and understanding like it's time just to come together and have these conversations and be open 
um, and have others others be open and receptive to receive. And um, yeah, it's just energy and time. Like I feel like I go off on a tangent, so I'm trying to keep it linear here. But yeah, I mean, we can do like I mean, like we can do all the things. We can listen to the podcast. We can uh, buy the books. We can get the checklist. We can download you know the ebook. We can attend all the webinars. Like there's so many things we can do. Um, if we're passionate and, and serious and committed doing this work, but um, if you can't hire on, like if you're a, so a solopreneur or a little bit more a smaller company building up, um, you can't hire on, you know, a DEI consultant. I really feel like this would be the perfect opportunity to get a really good working capital on how to forge a better way for the tomorrows of tomorrow. Yeah, I think you make it make a great point it's like a, it's a perfect entry place for people who are like starting to dip their toe into this work or maybe they're like they're waiting in and they're just not sure what to do next or where to go next uh and i know we're all busy right three days of my work week it's a big chunk of my work week uh but i love the invitation to like stop and pause and like let other work fall away for a moment so that I can really reflect on like, you know, where I am, where do I want to go? It's like the standard, you know, when you're doing like your 90 day plan or your yearly theme, right? It's like, we need this time to stop and learn and reflect so that we can like move forward with intention. Otherwise we're just doing random stuff, right? We won't, we want like a cohesive approach. Right, yeah. And I think it's perfect timing too, because I actually had, um, well, I have a couple clients um, where we're mapping out like the Q4 strategy, you know, for business lingo. <laughs> um, and having this roundtables at this time, it really, like you said, I was able to kind of pause because I found myself like in the busy work. Okay, we got to do this. We got to do this. Okay, what are we doing here? Okay, what's the standard here? Okay, how much are you? Like I was doing all the numbers and like the back end stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute we didn't carve out time to make sure that we were prioritizing this. And so it was a perfect opportunity even for me to be reminded like, oh yes, this needs to be baked in and we need to have this as a priority moving forward. And how I always believe in like how you, and well, there's like a saying, like I had a mentor a couple years ago where she's like the energy that you end the, the year with is typically the new energy you bring in with you in the very beginning of the year. And so I think this is a perfect opportunity to like you said, have a little bit of a pause, stepping back objectively, being open to receive and also ways to integrate it, you know, in the here and the now and have it be something tangible and real, but then also setting the tone for where you want to go for next year. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love that, right? It's all about our energy, like you were saying earlier. And so this does, I think, create a really uh, like safe container for you to figure out, you know, how do you feel about this and where do you want to go and what do we do next uh collectively and individually yeah i love it those are all the questions that i had um i'm so happy that we were able to just have this deep dive i left it open and loose and kept it just conversational flow so um i'm happy that we were able just to talk about things that we're passionate about and i'm just really excited that we get to be able to be a part of this i'm so happy that i got to connect with you share i'm super excited and passionate when i when i first went to your website i was like I didn't know somebody did this and this is freaking amazing. Like, I, I don't know, it's just like, I guess maybe I'm in my bubble sometimes and I know there's a big world out there. There's a ton of amazing people and I need to get myself out there more. So this is my, um, my own journey in that, but I love how you are really championing through and you're, I don't know, just, I just love what you do. Just, uh, I don't know, I'll, we'll, I'll link it in the comments after <laughs> we end here, but if you want to learn more about Cher, um, and the great work she's doing over there at Ginkgo PR. Um, I'll have the opportunity for you to learn more about that. Um, did you wanna share anything about how the audience can get in contact with you if they wanna learn more? Yeah, I mean, the website is the best place. Feel free to always reach out if you have any like visibility questions or questions about how you can get onto podcasts. I'm always happy to be that resource for you. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to have connected this way as well. I cannot wait to see what we both learn during the roundtables. 
Yeah, me too. So thank you all for tuning in and I'll have the information if you'd like to join, share, and I, as well as the nine other panels that will be featured over the three day um, Hills Roundtable. So I'll have the information at the end for that. And um, until next time, we'll see you, see you later. <laughs>